Good day. Thank you so much for joining us at Rama South Coast Family Church. As you listen or watch this DVD, our prayer for you is that your life will be inspired, that you'll grow spiritually, and that you'll get to know your Father in heaven in a deeper and greater way. Enjoy the teaching. Well, the title of my message this morning is that two is greater than ten. Two is greater than ten. Now, I know that isn't good maths, but I want you to know it's brilliant theology. Because if you've got God on your side, it doesn't matter who's against you. Can you say amen? And so we're going to look at a story this morning that I think is, is really significant and apt not just for us as a church, but for the Christian church as whole uh, this morning. And we're going to turn to Numbers chapter 13 uh, in a minute. You can find your place in your Bibles if you want to do that. And we just want to paint this picture as we go into the teaching this morning. God has delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. A picture of a believer getting born again. How many when you get born again, you get washed in the blood of Jesus, you get cleansed, can you say amen? You become a brand new creation in Christ. But how many of you know not everything changes because your mind is not saved and your body is not saved? How many of you know your flesh every now and then likes to come and visit you? Like last week when uh, Japan beat the Springboks, how many of you know my flesh came to visit me and I was really, really upset. This morning I feel the anointing much stronger. <laughs> okay, I'm only joking. But how you know, your flesh can give you a hard time sometimes. And I want you to know that we need to realize today as believers that even although we're born again, we're washed in the blood of Jesus, God has given us our inheritance. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. How many of you, not, not all of us, or not any of us, has completely entered the promised land yet? How many of you, there is territory you still need to take in your life. There are things still in your life today that God wants to empower you to overcome so that you can be more like Jesus. Can you say amen? Come on, just say amen if you think I'm quietly online there. Now, Moses, here in the story, number three, chapter 13, he selects 12 spies at the instruction of God, and he tells them to go into the promised land to check it out. The interesting thing is this, or, or maybe the scary thing, I should rather say, that only two, that is Joshua and Caleb, out of the 12 spies ever entered the promised land. That's not good statistics. Two out of 12 is not good. Can you say amen? And so I want you to know this morning, I want to talk to you about what you and I can do to make sure that we are part of the two. Can you say amen? That, that we take hold of the promised land that God has for our lives and that we continue to move forward. This story is really significant because it's mentioned by David in Psalm 95 verse 7 as a warning, and again, it's, it's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, where the writer of Hebrews, best known as the Apostle Paul, says this, Therefore, the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. It's a warning and a caution to you and I that God wants us to enter into the rest of faith to move by grace and take hold of everything that he has for you and I in our lives. How many of you this morning, can I just check, you're determined to get a hold of everything God has for you in this life? Can you say amen? I knew I'd come to the right church this morning. And so what we've got to realize as we, as we look into this context this morning, we need to recognize that spiritual advances require faith. And we need to recognize, not only does it require faith, but we need to recognize this morning that unbelief compromises your faith and never sees beyond the difficulties that we face in life. Unbelief sees walled cities and giants rather than the presence and the power of God. Unbelief looks at obstacles, but faith looks at God. Can you say amen? And says, our God is more than enough. And so I want you to know, as, as the 12 spies went in to spy out the land, 10 of the spies came back with a negative report. They, they led the people and incited the people to complain and, and moan against God and moan against the leadership. But Joshua and Caleb encouraged and challenged the people to a greater level of faith. Look at the person next to you and say, it's time to grow your faith. 
You see, a positive faith always looks to God. So let's pick up the story. We're not going to have time to go through every verse in context, but I'll encourage you, go home this week, read Numbers 13, read Numbers 14, and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, place this and minister to you in your own heart. Numbers 13, verse 1 and 2, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So we see that if we're going to be part of the two, if we're going to be like Joshua and Caleb and have that spirit of faith, we will be able to show the next generation into its new levels of favor, of grace, and of increase. However, if we side with the ten spies and we become negative in our thinking, we become controlled by the negative things that are happening in our surroundings, all that will happen is, I want you to know, it will drag us down and we'll never see the promised land that God has for us. I want to encourage you this morning not to look at this as a general message, but to look at it as a message for you, for your life. Where are you today? What promised land has God given you to take in the upcoming days, weeks, months, and years? You see, giants aren't meant to defeat us. Giants are there to promote you. Can you say amen? Look at the person next to you and say, you can this morning. All right, that was a little bit weak for a Sunday morning. Uh, you, you can do better than that. Look at the person on the other side and say, you can this morning. You can. In Acts 7, verse 9 to 10, it says that the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. They sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions. Say, all his afflictions. And gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him ruler over Egypt and over all of his household. I want to just talk to you this morning in the time we have about a couple of things you can think about today, principles, ideas, concepts from the Word that you can apply in your life that will help you to make sure that you stay part of the two. How many of you want to be part of the two this morning? I did something many years ago. I wasn't going to do it, but I just, I, I love doing it, so I'm going to just give in to my temptation this morning. Uh, many years ago, a, a friend of mine taught me this a little saying, and I, I just held on to it. And I taught our church it many, many years ago when we started. And uh, it simply goes like this. I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to give me an answer. I'm going to say to you, do you want to be part of the two or part of the ten? And you're going to say, part of the two, part of the two. Can we try that? Okay, you guys look like you're still asleep. So I'm going to work with these guys over here. Do you want to be part of the ten or part of the two? Alrighty. Now, if you're working with me, you know I've set you up in a good way. Do you want to be part of the two or part of the ten? Part of the two, part of the two. Amen. We're going over. Can you say amen? We're not going under. We're not going to let the devil steal from us. We're not going to let him take our joy. We're going over, not under. Can you say amen? We're above and not beneath because God is on our side. Now to just bring this into a little bit more perspective, we're not going to turn to verse 16, but I want you to know after the, the Bible tells us the names of the 12 spies who went into the promised land, we find an interesting thing happen in verse 6. It says, and the spies whose name was Hoshea, Moses renamed Joshua. And I thought like, well, why would the Holy Spirit put verse 16 there? Because why would we need to know that, that Moses decided to change Hashua's name to Joshua? Well, if you go study it in the Hebrew, I think you get the answer. The original name for Hashua means salvation, or it actually means to desire salvation, to want salvation. And the name Joshua means Yahweh is salvation. So Moses, before they go into the promised land, he says this. He says, I'm going to change your name from desiring salvation to God is your salvation. It's a picture of Jesus this morning. And I want you to know that in Jesus, you have everything you need. You are complete. You are victorious. You are an overcomer. And you have eternal life. Can you say amen? 
That is the gospel of good news. And so everything we, we study this morning, we see it in the light of the gospel of grace. We see it in the light of who and what Jesus is and has done in our lives. So let's turn down to verse 17 and let's look at our first example here. It says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way. Would you say that with me? Say, go up. Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains. Say the mountains. And see, say see, what the land is like. Whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. The first thing we need to do and the first thing we can do to apply in our lives if we want to be part of the two is we must be willing to go up and see what God wants to do. What does it mean to go? It means you're going to have to leave where you are today because God wants to stretch you and take you to a new season. God wants to take you to a new place and before he takes you there, he needs you to see it. It speaks about having a vision in your life. It speaks about having a a discernment in your life that even although where you are now, there might be difficulty, there might be things happening, those are really the birthing pains that will take you to where you need to be going and where God wants to take you. So are you willing this morning to go up and spy out the land? It's a picture of a positive faith that says, I may be where I am now and I may not be happy where I am now, but thank God I'm not where I used to be and I'm not staying where I am, I'm going to go up. I'm going to move closer. I'm going to draw into what God has for my life. I want you to know it's a picture of the believer who spends time in the Word to study the Word and renew their mind so that we can see who it is God has said we can be. If you never take time to renew your mind and study the Word of God, you're going to have difficulty seeing the things that God wants you to see. Can you say amen? Have a look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 5 and 6, I'm reading out of the Amplified. It says, examine and test and evaluate your own selves. Not somebody else, but evaluate your own self to see whether you are holding to your faith. Can I just see, are you holding your faith this morning? Amen. And and the Apostle Paul is telling the church, he says, listen, evaluate, test, see that you are holding on to your faith faith. And look at the next line. I love this in the Amplified. It says, and showing the proper fruits of it. You see, faith will produce something in your life. Faith will produce action in your life. It'll cause you to act on what you believe God is saying. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. Do you not realize and know thoroughly by ever increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved, on trial, and rejected. But I hope you will recognize and know that we are not disapproved on trial or rejected. You see, faith does not deny the reality of difficulty. Faith doesn't deny the the, the reality of obstacles or challenges or problems. But I want you to know faith declares in the face of the difficulty... God is able to help me. God will give me wisdom. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to trust God. I'm going to look to the Word of God. I'm going to look to the Holy Spirit's leading in my life so that I can start moving forward. Number two, let's turn to Numbers 13 and verses 20. It says in verse 20, whether the land, go and spy out the land, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests there or not, and be of good courage. And bring some of the fruits of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Number two, the second thing we can do so that we make sure we're part of the two and not part of the ten is we need to realize this morning it's going to take courage for you and I to keep serving God. It's going to take courage for you and I to keep moving forward with the plan and purpose that God has for us. It's going to take courage to take hold of the promise of God in your life. You see, sometimes it's not easy as a believer to be honest with yourself. But a positive faith has courage and continually looks to the word of God. And instead of running from God, it runs to God and spends time in worship. You see, listen, courage isn't the absence of discouragement. Courage comes to play when you want to be discouraged. 
When you want to quit, when you want to give up, that's when courage needs to rise up in you. And I want you to know, it doesn't matter where you are today, it doesn't matter what you've been going through, I want you to know you need to run to God, don't run from Him. If you're having a bad day, you know, then sometimes the best thing you can do instead of having a Kit Kat and having a break, have a praise break. Can you say amen? Go hide yourself somewhere in the toilet, look up a good praise song on YouTube and just have yourself a praise party. Say, Pastor, what will my co-workers think? Who cares what they think? Because you'll come out of the toilet and you'll be smiling, happy and full of joy. Can you say amen? John 16, 33, it says this, I have told you these things, this is Jesus speaking, so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Come on, say that with me. Say, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Even in the midst of trouble or persecution, we can have a joyful peace and a certainty and a confidence in Christ's victory. Listen this morning, Jesus himself is giving you and I advice here, and this is what he's saying. Child of God, be of good cheer. What does it mean to be of good cheer? It means to have a joy, to have a, have a, have a lightness about you, uh, not because you don't care, but you, because you know God does care. Come on, let's just take a deep breath. Hold it. Come on, can I just see you smile this morning? Can I just see if you brushed this morning? Come on, show me some teeth. Come on, look at the person next to you and just laugh at them a little. No, laugh with them a little bit. Don't laugh at them. Laugh with them. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> oh, this is much better. Can you say amen? Sometimes you need to just step away from what you're going through and just have a good little laugh. And just say, you know what, Lord? Things are going crazy. I'm stressing out. But you know what, God? I know you're in the boat with me. I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm not going to be hopeless. I'm going to be of good cheer because you said to me, Lord, if I'm of good cheer, I will exercise my faith and I'll overcome what I'm going through. Are you happy you came to church this morning? Come on, give a high five to the person next to you. Say, oh, this is awesome this morning. All right, so number one is, are you willing to go up and see what God wants to do in your life? Number two, you're going to have to have courage. Number three, in verse 30 of Numbers 13, it says, And then Caleb quieted the people. Say quieted. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with him said, The ten spies said, No, we are not able to go up against this people. They are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. Say, Bad report. Bad. Say it like a sheep. Say, Bad. bad. I love being your shepherd. You are such good sheep. Come on, say it again. Say, Bad report. I don't want no bad report. Can you say amen? amen. The, the interesting thing about the story, all 12 spies saw exactly the same thing. The two, Joshua and Caleb, what had they done? They were willing to go up. They had experienced God. They had seen God doing great things. They had remembered how God delivered them out of Egypt, how God opened the Red Sea, how God had fed them in the wilderness. And because they were seeing the right things, they were able to respond in the right way. And look what Joshua and Caleb said. They said, let us go up at once, for we are able. They brought a bad report and they, and about the land that they had spied out and the land through which we have gone as spies in the land devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw there are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in their own sight and so we were in their sight. Number three, the third thing you've got to do when you're facing challenges to make sure you're part of the two is you've got to calm down and focus on the right thing. Notice what Caleb said here. Caleb said to the people, he quieted them. He said, listen guys, calm down 
and let's focus on Yeshua. Let's focus on Jehovah, our salvation. Yes, the giants are big. Yes, the challenges are many. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but our God has given us the ability. He wasn't looking at, at what, was going, what he was going through. He wasn't looking at his own ability. He was looking at his God. He was looking at who God is in his life. And so our third thing this morning is we've got to calm down and focus on the right things. Very often it's our own emotions and feelings that drag us in the direction of wanting to panic, become negative, and bring a bad report. Focus your attention on Jesus changes everything because he overcame. He won the victory. He went to the cross, and I bet the devil was rejoicing for those three days, thinking he'd won the victory. But how many know the whole time the Spirit of God was hovering, waiting for the moment, and the Bible says he raised him from the dead. And that same power, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you this morning. Woo! Yeah! Come on, say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on, say, I'm powerful in Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. So I want to ask you this morning, just, uh, just want to add something to this this morning. What are you facing? What are you facing this morning? What, what giant is standing in front of you saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you out. You're never going to make it past this point. You're never going to get better. You're never going to overcome this. You're never going to be able to move forward. What giant are you facing this morning? Let's make this real to us. It's not just a story. It's a spiritual reality of those who want to serve God and serve Christ and make a difference in this world. There will be giants. It's interesting if you, if you read the preceding verses uh, or just after this, it speaks about the different ites that were there. There were the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Malachites and all these arts that they had to face, including all the giants. This was a land that was amazing, that flowed with milk and honey, but there were giants in the land. You see, and after you're saved, you need to realize today that you're not in a perfect world, that you, that you are called out of, but you're going to have to face some of those things in your life because we're living in a fallen world and there's a bad devil out there who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to rob your testimony. And most of all, he wants to steal your faith. And we've got to rise up. You know, it's quite interesting. If you look at these words in the Hebrew, uh, it kind of gives us a picture and brings it a little bit nearer home. Let me give you some of the definitions. Giants represent things that are bigger and stronger than us. They very often represent strongholds or oppression, things in our lives that, that have oppressed us or that the enemy wants to use to limit our freedom. All right, if we look, the, the next art is the Amalekites. The Malachites represent a great number of foreigners. In other words, it speaks about unusual things that happen in our lives that are designed to discourage us or break us down. How many of you have had some unusual things happen to you? All right, then we've got the Hittites. If you go look at the word of the Hittites in the, in the Hebrew, it speaks about terror. And, and so that's the fear that the enemy tries to bring against you. You see, fear is designed to rob you of your faith and get you to panic and get you to give up. Paul said to Timothy, my God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Can you say amen? Are you dealing with fear this morning? The Jebusites. If you go look at that word Jebusites, it speaks about being trodden down or broken. It speaks about a threshing floor that was used to tread down and break down the corn and, 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 and tramp out the grapes. And I want you to know sometimes the enemy has trodden over you and he's broken and bruised you through life's uh, circumstances, through relationships and things that have gone wrong. How many of you have had things go wrong in your life? People have hurt you. People have said things. Things didn't work. And, and how many of you know, if you allow those things, they will break you down. They will, they will they'll trod on you and they'll make you feel like you're worthless. I love the communion service this morning. How many of you know, you are loved today. You are highly favored. Even if things have gone wrong this morning. I've, I've had my fair share of things go wrong in my life. Can you say amen? But you know, as you come to the table of communion, you can reconcile those things. And you can make peace and you can allow the Holy Spirit to comfort you and strengthen you and heal you. 
Just close your eyes right now. I believe God's presence is here right now. And, and some of us that have been going through stuff and, and struggling, you can just allow the Holy Spirit right where you are. He can just heal you. He can just comfort you. He can just break that thing in your life so that you can just experience the depth and the love of Almighty God. Then there were the Amorites. Now the Amorites were, were people who, who were proud and, and arrogant and prominent. And it speaks about sometimes we've got to deal with pride in our lives. How many of you know pride comes before a fall? It's like the one brother I was talking to, he said, Pastor, I want you to know I am so humble, I'm proud of it. <laughs> you know, those, those two words can't go in the same sentence. There's something wrong with that picture. And I want you to know all of us have to learn to deal with pride in our lives. We, even as ministers, sometimes we can become spiritually proud and think that we know it all or that we're better. And I want you to know at the end of the day, we're nothing without Jesus. Amen. We, we cannot accomplish anything without the grace of God and the Spirit of God working in our lives. And we've got to learn to deal with that pride and, 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 and confront it in our lives. Then there was the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were, were, were people who were proud. We, we also know the Canaanites had goddesses. Uh, so they, they, they created idols for, uh, for the uh, Israelites to worship that distracted them and took them away from, from serving God. So that, that speaks about idolatry, but it also speaks about humiliation. How many of you know sometimes things happen to us and they humiliate us? They, they make us feel ashamed and guilty and broken down and condemned. And I want you to know condemnation robs you of your confidence in God. And I love what Paul said in Romans 8. He says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The next verse says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You are free this morning. Say, I'm free. Come on, just shake your hands like you're free. Hallelujah. You're free this morning. Can you say amen? All right, we're doing well. We, we've got a few more principles to go to, another 76 of them. Uh, so we, we're moving along well here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 and 15, it's 13 to 15, it says, we're not going to keep quiet, not on your life. I'm reading out of the, the, the message translation. It just brings out this one aspect. It says, just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, and so I said it, we say what we believe, and what we believe is the one who raised up the master Jesus will just as certainly raise, up with you, uh, raise us up with you alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. So we recognize this morning our ability doesn't come from our greatness or our ability. It comes from Christ's victory. Can you say amen? He's the one who gets all the praise. Now, let's go down to Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Numbers 14, verse 1 to 4, it says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses. Say complained. Amen. Say it with a bit of passion. Say complained. Amen. Have any of you ever complained about something? <sighs> Lord, help me. <laughs> Mandy's telling me she never complains. And she doesn't. She's actually quite good. I had a complaint fit yesterday when we were going to wash our dogs. And I came to my tap and realized that my garden boy had removed the fitting from my tap. And it couldn't find it anywhere. And I just had a complaint moment. And Mandy reminded me of my message from Friday night. <laughs> came back to haunt me. <laughs> I realized afterwards that was really stupid. She didn't, she didn't actually get on my case. She was actually very kind. She said, they're just doing what you always do. <laughs> All right, let's move along because I want to keep my points that I've worked hard to earn. So all the congregation lifted up their voices. They complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, listen to this, if only we died in the land of Egypt. If only we died in the wilderness. Listen, why did the Lord bring us out of bondage? Think about what they're saying. They're like, we would rather go back to Egypt where we were beaten every day, where we had little food, and we were treated as slaves. We'd rather go back to that 
than face the giants in the promised land. Why? Because of a negative report. Guys, you need to protect your mind and your ears from what you listen to. Because in a moment like this, it can steal your faith from your heart. I know there's a lot of things happening in our country today that aren't exciting, but I want to just encourage you today as a person of faith, don't fix your eyes on what's going wrong. Fix your eyes on the fact that Jesus has put us here to make a difference, to be a positive influence, to stand up against those giants, and let's be an influence, let's be positive, let's be the difference. Can you say amen? And if we go down, we're going to go down fighting our fight of faith. Can you say amen? And it says they complained bitterly and they wept the whole night because of 10 people's report that was negative. Now, my point here is simply this. The local church is the hope of the world. And I want to encourage you this morning. You need to get into a good local church. You need to find a home where you can put down your roots, where you can flourish, where you can become partner with what God is doing. Because I want you to know today that these guys, they moaned against Moses. And then after they mo moaned against Moses and Aaron, they started moaning against God. And it literally brought them to a place where God said, none of you will see the promised land. And I don't want to bring condemnation and guilt on you this morning. What I'm saying is let's protect our hearts, let's find a home, and let's realize today God has called us together as this local church, but then corporately as the body of Christ to work together to make a difference, to work in unity, to flourish, and to be an example of the goodness and the favor and the flavor of God's grace. Listen to Hebrews 13. I want to read two verses, verses 7, and then I'm going to jump down to verses 17. Remember those who rule over you or those who lead you, uh, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. What must you follow? Their faith. Follow their faith and consider the outcome of their conduct. Then look at verse 17. Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. I learned a lesson 20 years ago when I joined the local church. I learned the scripture. God gave me the scripture, and I made a decision. I'm not going to complain against my leadership. I'm not going to complain against God when I go through things, but I'm going to be a blessing, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to guard my heart because the enemy tries to set you up for offense. He tries to set you up to be offended and to get hurt at something that happens or something somebody says or something the pastor does, and, and the, the intent of it is to neutralize your faith is to stop you, to get you to give up and stop moving forward. And I want to encourage you this morning, the church is the hope of the world. And as we move forward, you know, in the next verse, you know what the writer of Hebrews says, verse 18? He says, therefore, pray for us. You know the key for leadership this morning? Pray for them. Pray for them. If you think you're going through things, multiply it by 20, and that's what your pastor's going through. That's what the leadership's going through, because they face the storm first. Not because we're something special. No, we're nothing special. We are just like you, part of the body of Christ. But I want you to know, when you want to complain, pray. When you want to get upset, pray. When you, look like something, when you think something's not happening the way, pray. And speak life. Can you say amen? Are you getting some help this morning? All right, let's go to the next one. Numbers 14. My time is nearly up. Verse 6 and 7. It says, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore off their clothes, and they spoke to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land, and we can possess it. What is this, number 5? Okay, the next one. Delays and obstacles are prophetic. Delays and obstacles are prophetic. You say, Pastor, what are you how many of you want to prophecy this morning? Here's one. Delays and obstacles are prophetic. You say, what are you talking about? Let me explain it to you. When you face delays and obstacles, they are prophetic in this sense. They are declaring to you that something's about to happen and now is not the time to quit. <laughs> 
Come on, say preach it, pastor. That is good preaching. Every time you face a delay, every time there's an obstacle that rises up, every time there's a giant in your face, go look at it in the Bible. Every time someone rose up in faith and overcome it, the blessing of God flooded. The grace of God flooded. Revival came. So when you face a delay or an obstacle or challenge, it's prophetically declaring to you, don't quit now. Your victory is at hand. You're going to make it if you don't quit, if you keep exercising your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in trouble. Continue steadfastly in prayer. You see, when you face obstacles or delays or things go wrong, it's also prophetically telling you now's the time to run to God in prayer. Now's the time to seek God. It says Joshua and Caleb, they didn't, they didn't rise up and say, forget all you guys, you, you don't even know who you are. What are you speaking? Never, we're not going to walk with you anymore. No, you know what they did? It says they tore off their clothes. It's a type of prayer and intercession. They went and pleaded with the people, said, come on, you can do this. Our God is great. God brought us this far. And they were exhorting them not to quit, not to give up. Now, we need to have wisdom as well when we face delays or obstacles because I I thought about this as well. You know, delays and obstacles are also prophetic in this sense is sometimes we face delays because of disobedience. And so, so it's prophetic in this sense as well. Maybe you need to just take a step back and, and look into your heart and ask the Holy Spirit to show you, is there something that you should be doing that you're not doing? Is, is there something that you've done that you shouldn't have done? Because sometimes the delay or the obstacle is a result of you having taken a wrong action or a wrong turn or, or reacted in the incorrect way. And so in that sense, it's also prophetic, just not in condemnation, just to go to the Father and say, Lord, man, I, I made that decision. I shouldn't have made it. Help me to get back to where I need to be. Amen. And so this, this is real stuff we need to think about. And so I want to encourage you today to exercise patience. Engage in prayer when things aren't working out. Say, God, I'm going to seek you. Uh, give me wisdom here. Show me how I can deal with and address this situation. All right, the last one, Numbers 14, verse 8 and 9. It says this, If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and he will give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. The last thing this morning that you and I can do to make sure we're part of the two and not part of the ten is we need to teach ourselves to speak the word only. Speak the word only. You know, so many times in my life I've gone through things and I've, I've yielded to the temptation without realizing it of starting to speak the negativity of the situation. Oh, what are we going to do? We don't have enough money. Oh, how we... And, and in your mind, you start making plans for failure. You start speaking out the wrong things from your mouth. And I want to encourage you this morning. If Mandy and I have learned anything in the last two years that God has brought us back to, it's this. Guard your mouth and speak the word only. Can I encourage your faith this morning? Our words carry tremendous power. If you are born again this morning, you have the Spirit of God inside of you. And I want you to know your words carry power. Let them carry the right power. Can you say amen? Mark 11 verse 22 to 26, it said, Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... Notice how many times the word says comes out in this portion of scripture. Whoever says to this mountain, uh, have faith in God, for I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that the things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you, be, when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Let's not stop there. Verse 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. 
Very often to keep things moving forward, to keep progressing, to engage in the change that God wants to bring about in our lives so that we can enter the promised land. It's going to take a decisive effort on our side to speak his word over that situation. I went one, of, one of my favorite times when I have prayer time and I'm waiting on the Lord and I'm praying about the church, one of my favorite times is when I get to declare faith over my church. And I say, Father, I thank you every businessman is going to prosper. Thank you every businesswoman is going to do well. Thank you that every marriage in this church will succeed. Thank you, Father God, we have no unemployment in this church because every person in this church who is unemployed will find a job in the name of Jesus. I declare by faith in the name of Jesus, we have the most generous congregation. We have the most excited congregation. We have the best volunteers in the whole nation. We have an incredible church can you say amen Amen. why because I'm going to speak the word hallelujah because you see you must never underestimate the power of positive faith number two I want you to know that goes with this verse is it says when you stand praying forgive and I want to encourage you church we've got to be the most forgiving people on the planet Jesus said this freely you have received freely give. And I want you to know there is a direct correlation and I believe it's not a mistake because you find it in other places in the New Testament where you and I receiving answers to prayer and trusting God in prayer is related to our heart in in relation to forgiveness and releasing other people that have hurt us. And I want to encourage you today uh, even if you're struggling in an area of forgiveness, ask the Holy Spirit to help you but release forgiveness. Let it go. Can you say me? It's not worth holding on to. I love what Pastor Ray says, you know, holding unforgiveness or bitterness in your heart is like you drinking poison and expecting someone else to die it's just going to contaminate your faith and rob you of your joy and cause you to miss out on your promised land are you happy this morning are you glad you came to church if you've listened or watched this dvd today and you'd like to make jesus christ the lord of your life it would be such a privilege for me to lead you in the prayer of salvation from Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ is your son, that you sent him into this world to die for me, and you raised him from the dead so that I could be saved. I open my heart and I accept Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. We'd also like to get a hold of your postal address so we can send you a Bible and some more information about what it means to be saved. We'd also encourage you to join a good word-based local church in your area. And if ever you're here on the South Coast, please pop in and visit us. God bless.